This is Space Cats Peace Turtles, the unofficial podcast for Fantasy Flight's Twilight Imperium. Episode 100, Christian T. Peterson. Music by Ben Prunty, featuring Matt Martins and Hunter Donaldson. I did the happy birthday Mr. President thing last year, so I can't do that again. I can't sing right. happy birthday to you. Well, you don't need to sing happy birthday at all, you know? We can well, just be two adult. I no, let's have an adult like... birthday. We've turned uh, two, okay? <laughs> We've turned two, and now we're an adult. We're adult. And uh, so instead of having some sort of silly birthday party... We are going to do something serious, basically. We're going to have a serious, serious adult party. And I don't mean... <laughs> never, now that I say not that, that out loud, that's party. not what I mean. <laughs> I do not mean an adult party to that extent. But a party for adults. How about that? Party for adults. Uh, uh, this is our 100th sort of episode. Sort yeah. of 100. And sort of two years. It's bas- I mean, this is basically two years. Um, I will say this, uh, for uh, those of you that get upset, about, which I don't know that there's anybody that gets upset nobody about gets it besides upset, me. Nobody gets upset for you. But <laughs> for, for those of you, for the huge group of you that get upset over Matt's insane numbering <laughs> system that has several different, li- like, rolling counts for the episodes. <laughs> this is the official episode 100. It is not actually our 100th episode, though, because he is a crazy man. Um, but I did convince him to simplify Stop. the numbering <laughs> systems going forward. So yeah. we can promise you episode 200 will probably, and 400 and 500 and 700 and, you know, 1100. And, you know, we're going to do the show till we the die. rest of our lives um, till we <laughs> die. Uh, and even then we will be replaced. Uh, right. Pass the torch on to the next young bucks. Uh, what no, did we do? No, 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 Matt, you misunderstand. There will be robo versions of both. Oh, of us that I, that I, see. I am actually currently building little. We will upload adult our consciousness dolls into adult in the... dolls. I will call them. <laughs> well, anyways, <laughs> this is uh, welcome to the horniest episode of Space Cats Be Turtles. Uh, pretty weird start to all this. What a strange, especially energy. considering, especially considering what the rest of this episode is, and that. Uh, this is a big boy episode. That yeah, we... <laughs> this is this is a big boy episode, and I'm really excited. And I think I think the reason I'm being so weird at the top is I'm just so confident that we got you we got you something good today. Okay, yeah. uh, we um, interviewed the man, the the man. He's not a myth or a legend. I mean, I guess he's a legend. He's not a myth though. Christian T. Peterson, the designer right. of Twilight right. Imperium. All of Agreed it. to talk to these two bozos. Yeah, you've been listening you to this uh, dumb rambling for like three minutes, and mm-hmm. and we we put him through that too. So yeah, no, 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 we did a good job. <laughs> We're good boys, and We're we good and, boys, and we we. I think it it's uh, one of it's probably my favorite interview piece we've done thus far. Um, it was very very fun, and I feel like it's uh, I don't know it's it's it was such a pleasure to talk to uh, it really CTP. Was. Yeah, so uh, I think without further ado, let's kick it yeah. over to our interview with Kristen T. Yeah. Peterson. Everyone, we we're here. We're here with Christian T. Peterson, the man, the myth, the legend. <laughs> Christian, hello. How are you? I'm great. How are you guys? Wonderful. I'm awesome. Congratulations on your 100th podcast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. All right. Thank you. Uh, we really appreciate that. And yeah, this is you are our special gift to our listeners and, and fans of your your board game. Uh, so this is this is a real treat to be able to bring you on here. And we want to talk about. Kind of all things Twilight Imperium, but we also want to talk about plenty of just things related to, to you and what you're going to be doing here in the future, where you're at, uh, what's been going on since you left uh, Fantasy Flight. So I think to kick things off, though, we really have to, to stick with, you know, Twilight Imperium. And we want to start by learning a little bit more about where Twilight Imperium uh, came from just initially. Obviously, it's this now like beloved universe and this beloved game that people have been playing for over 20 years. Uh, for you, though, 
where where did Twilight Imperium, uh, I guess, start? How long was the Twilight Imperium universe in your head before the game was fully realized? I would say it evolved over time. The the um, when we first started Fantasy Flight, as you may have heard elsewhere, we actually were uh, we're a comic book company. We wanted to import uh, uh, European comics uh, and sell them. Um, that was the business idea, anyway. Uh, I, I'd been a gamer, you know, all my life, playing tons and tons of board games, and during college. Got into magic as just got started, and um, uh, so I was a gamer. But uh, we started this 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 business, this comic book business, uh, where we learned how to print stuff. And um, unfortunately, the the comic book didn't sell at all. So we, <laughs> we uh, were um, uh, you know a little bit of a hard pressed. Uh, we, we basically were, were like in a, a, a negative equity situation. I, I said, well, guys, you know, I um, when I said guys, it's the investors and the advisors that we had at the time, and um, I said, guys, you know, I. I, I think that we may be running into a dead end with uh, with these comic books, but um, I, I think we can make a game because not only did have we learned how to to uh, produce all this stuff, um, but I was also you know a gamer and uh, there, there was some benefit in the comic book industry in that still the, the stores that sell hobby games and the stores that sell comics have a have a huge overlap. Right. So yeah. so we That's were. Interesting. I was able to uh, to get, have a bunch of connections into that area uh, through through the connections in the comic book side. So I said, let's let's make a game. Mm-hmm. I always wanted to play a uh, kind of a big epic uh, space game. Yeah, you know that yeah. had that had reasonably light rules. When I say reasonably light rules, you know we were used to playing a lot of the old Avalon Hill games, which had very heavy rule sets. So so I so I felt that. Uh, you know that Twilight Imperium at the time was a very light, light rule set. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> later, right. <laughs> later, uh, you know, rules got lighter and lighter, and uh, uh, relatively, I think Twilight Imperium rule set got heavier. But um, so we, I, I started, uh, I started designing that. I had this idea that I would use hexagons uh, to, to create a variable galaxy. That that came from uh, a game called Magic Realm uh, from from Avalon Hill, and I, I loved the idea that that um, that you could use hexagons. Magic Round was even more innovative in a way because it actually had had uh, hexagons on uh, were printed on both sides, and so you could flip the hexagons around to get to the underground portions of the of the that oh kind of, wow that kind of fantasy map. So that was that was really uh, cool. I, I didn't think we could afford at the time printing on both sides of the board, so we we didn't do anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, the idea of of course having a variable galaxy was was interesting, and and, um, and there was nothing else like that out there at the time. So yeah. I started putting that together, and I was always I was always really appreciative of the uh, of the companies that that were able to infuse their board game with a lot of story and flavor, and particularly somebody who'd done a re- really great job of that was was Games Workshop. Uh, some of the early games that they, they yeah. put out were did a great job of that, and I'm like I always wanted to do that um, if I ever made a game because I I really felt that having a connection with with the with the background story just helped players along. Uh, with their imagination, and if they had imagination, then they would have more fun while they were playing. They would get into their, you know, into their factions, into, into the game more. Uh, and so I, I spend a bunch of time trying to come up with some some innovative races in the background that um, that that would work. And I'm not, I'm not sure that you could say they were innovative because it was a you know fairly fairly typical stuff. You know, your water people, your lion people, and, and so <laughs> um, but, typical. But but yeah, I, but um, but what I did is I tried to. to Come up with some ideas for backgrounds of them, which were, of course, amalgamation of all the science fiction and fantasy and history that, that I knew. For example, I mean, Mechatol Rex is actually my Mechatol is an anagram for Camelot, right? Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, just just try to throw you know all, all this kind of flavor in there. Um, but the first the first edition of Twilight Imperium had had a you know a relatively small amount of text in there uh, for for the races. I was more concerned about, from, from a story perspective, um, I, I was frankly more concerned about getting the game out. It was very difficult to get out for us to be able to afford to, to make it. So we put as much, much story in there as I thought it needed and whatever art uh, we could afford. A guy named Bill Hagee, who was here, lived in Minnesota, came and drew, drew for us. So, so the very early drawings were, were done by a local guy, a very great guy named Bill. And um, so, we, so we put the game out. Finally, wow. yeah, we we were scraped, we scraped the money together to, to 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 put it out. It was it was it was tricky, um, but we did it. Uh, and so um, went to to a couple of uh, open houses for distributors, and went to um, to Origins back in uh, 1997 with with the game. We loaded up my 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 small station wagon and just, just drove drove to Origins. <laughs> and, uh, 
We sold everything uh, that we had the first day. But, the, but after they sold out, you know, on the first day, we didn't have anything to sell, but we just kept demoing. You know, at the time, I know it may be hard to imagine today, but there was almost no board games. There was, the industry was, was much, much smaller. The games that were really moving were you know, Magic, obviously, that was, was, uh, was, was very dominant. Uh, and then role playing in miniatures, uh, board games really had gone the way of way of the dodo uh, at that time. Even Avalon Hill, just a year prior to um, Twilight and Pyramid coming out, had actually sold themselves to to Hasbro and kind of shut down everything that they did. Hasbro at the time, I think, bought them primarily because of the Civilization brand, which they wanted to hook up to Sid Meier's Civilization. Right. Um, so I'm not sure they even cared that much about the the, the board games in general. Uh, the, the, one of the people there, I know, Mike Gray, certainly cared. And later he was able to get some of them out. But for the, the marketplace, it was, it was really, uh, there was really nothing much there. So, so I think uh, Twilight Imperium uh, was lucky, hopefully because of how it played, but also because it was, it was lucky in, in its timing. Uh, it, it came mm -hmm. out when almost nothing was there. And yeah. it, it was considered to be a very expensive board game at $45 at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> a ludicrous $45. Oh, yeah. No, that was considered to be very expensive. Um, mm -hmm. And, and uh, of course, it's, it's quite difficult to, to try to put as much game as you want into a game that's $45 and you can only print a couple thousand of and, and, uh, and so on. So, mm -hmm. so there was, it, was, it was really rough uh, to trying to figure out how to afford uh, putting the amount of game in there that we wanted. So yeah. if you go back and look at a first edition, I think uh, people would be be surprised that, that that was actually the order of the day. You know, you had tear out cards and thin little little jits and uh, and so on, and that that was right. just in 1997. Um, so anyway, so that that's how, how how it came about. And then from a from a story perspective, you know, that as a game did did well, we printed it a couple times. You know, I started thinking more and more about it and, and wanted to develop the the, um, the 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 actual background more. Yeah. So is that something that became more of a uh, project in each of the expansions, or would you say that's something that introduced itself more in second edition? I mean, I guess where where did the the true story for TI really get a chance to start shining uh, for for you? Yeah. I mean, the, the the I mean, the story kind of developed, you know, in my head all the way from the beginning. Uh, the, what was the what kind of the basic uh, the basics were there, uh, and, and and a lot of the a lot of the terms and a lot of the the, the, the philosophy. The, the idea for Twilight Imperium re really is kind of uh, you know uh, civilizations emerging from this post apocalyptic time um and um from a, from a narrative historical concept I, I think it's more like a almost like the 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 evolution going up to world war one where you have all these empires that are mm -hmm. you know establishing colonies and and um and uh you know there's this web of intrigue uh, uh, among nations and empires and and technology uh, is at the backdrop of enormous technology technological change uh, in, in in the industrial revolution and across world war one um so that that's sort of the, the, the some of the inspiration behind uh, what what could cause kind of a, a nice, fascinating, dramatic environment, and then you can throw these races in there and hopefully try to create as, as interesting a backstory as you know as you can for them, uh, and try to make them you know familiar but also uh, ha have some depth and, and hopefully some some newness. The I, I wouldn't say that everything really came together uh, in in kind of a major way until the the third edition came out in 2005 oh interesting mm. okay so so then walk me through kind of a couple of those editions uh it feels like a lot of the things that define twilight imperium are the 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 production trends and then other just mechanical trends in board gaming and and sort of your reaction to them i mean a, a big part of ti4 is just the idea that like we we have so much improved production costs it's worth revisiting this this IP and everything, but even from its initial genesis, you're saying, you know, TI1 was built off the back of, we've learned about production, this is how we can make a game out of it. How do you think those trends in gaming have sort of influenced each iteration and, and then opening that up to kind of what you're saying about uh, third edition and why third edition was finally the chance for the story to shine? Yeah. Um, so I think it's important to to remember the the time each one came out. So so if we take a look at first edition, uh, the design for first edition was quite different from from what would later come up, uh, what would later do. In, I would later do in third. Um, first edition really came from my background in playing you know your traditional American uh, simulationist uh, strategy games, whether it's Avalon Hill or SBI or any any of those. Right. Um, certainly there was also some some influence from from the. Uh, for, 
in terms of the, the strive uh, towards simplicity from from games like like uh, like Axis and Allies and Shogun and those nice games from the uh, from the, uh, the from the Game Master line, which were pretty impressive, they were very impressive at the time. You know, I would have I would have given a lot to have have been able to put out a Twilight Imperium the way it would come out later at that time, because mm. you know, we really wanted to make an awesome kind of a Game Master line game set in space. Um, and uh, but that wasn't something we could afford. And and uh, when you look at games though from that from that era. Um, even some of the Game Master games, they're very phase dependent. So, so they, they have these steps you go through. So what happens is I'll, I'll do my turn and I got to do this step and that step and that step and that step. And, and you do that to create the engine to, to make sure everything clicks and balances. And then from time to time, you have to let somebody else take, you know, either internally in a phase or they have to go for the whole phase structure themselves. So, so that was pretty typical where you would take your turn and somebody else would go have a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and that's, that was just what, you, you, what we knew. Um, second edition, um, so first edition it did well, uh, you know, in context, I think we sold we, uh, the first print on, I think it was 1500 copies and it sold out very quickly. And then we printed another 3000. Um, and those, they, they sold more slowly. Uh, keep in mind the market back then was, was, was very small. There was maybe, right. uh, there was maybe 400 stores, uh, in the U S carrying the game and, and maybe a few hundred in the rest of the world. Um, it started started slowing down. Uh, the expansions did did pretty well, but when I say pretty well, it, that means I could sell two or three thousand of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, it, like, if I have a piece of artwork that costs, you know, a couple thousand dollars, uh, you know, then I'm basically, you know, one dollar a copy just goes into the artwork as, as an example for the for the um, um, uh, which was which was huge for for a game that you would maybe get you know six bucks or seven bucks for uh, when right. you sold it. Um, Second edition came out after we had um, we had evolved the business. Uh, in addition to Twilight, Fantasy Flight started developing other games. Uh, we had a, we had a big game in '99. We almost we almost went out of business really in '98 and '99. But just due to the strain of of dealing with cash flow uh, in, in in the gaming business can can be really tough because you of course want to try to work and and you have fixed costs every month and and uh, but then you also have to reprint and you have to put all your cash into inventories. And, and uh, so your publishing is funny that way. Is that you're always short on cash if you're if you're doing well. If you don't doing well, that's a different problem. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but you're basically building inventories and you're building receivables and and um, and then so so it was pretty tough. We had a game called Disc Wars uh, that I designed with, with a gentleman named Tom Jolly um, back in '99, which which was did really well. Uh, that that did better than anything else. Uh, and so it enabled us to pay a bunch of debts and kind of reorganize the business and start focusing on some smaller board games. So we came out with a small board game line uh, that we did. I designed some of them. Some of them we were we were uh, we did with other people. Uh, we started getting more into international business. Uh, and so the business kind of evolved um, and we were able to to get a get some different production um, capacities and some different production connections. And uh, after, a, I think it was in Try to remember when when the, the second edition came out. It's probably around two thousand one or two thousand two. You guys may actually know that better than remember that better than I do. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's two thousand. Uh, was Ti two base game in yeah. two thousand. So so I think that Twilight Imperium probably had been out of print for maybe a year or, or so, and uh, we decided that we could just do better um, that than what was in the in the original edition. So we so we put out a second edition that that corrected some of the issues. It, it tried, it, it solved, a, solved a few rules. It tried to put a little more color uh, art and, and a little bit better graphics. Cause we'd also uh, got Brian Schomburg, Scott Schomburg's brother. Um, he started working for us in, in uh, 99, end of 99. And so we finally had a, had a real graphic artist that wasn't me, which was awesome. Uh, and and uh, so, so he, um, he was able to make everything look a bunch better than I could. And, um, and, so, and, so, and so we put that out and I think we printed four or five thousand of that and I think there was maybe only one printing of that um, because it, it, it did well but it was board games still weren't you know um, super hot Settlers of Catan had, had started to really build a base for board games yeah and some of the European board games had started coming in um, but just around that time Pokemon and uh yeah, it was was terribly disruptive to the industry, uh, <laughs> and um, it turned out that that uh, that Dungeons and Dragons Third Edition uh, came out and it did the it did the Open D twenty license at the time, uh, and that was that was a real godsend uh, for for a lot of publishers because we were able to basically go out and make Dungeons and Dragons books, uh, and, and so we put out a whole line of books called Legends and Layers, 
we put out Twilight Imperium Second Edition. We put out a whole bunch of other games. Uh, you know, at that time, uh, the industry was really feeling exciting. Um, a lot of stuff going on, and uh, and we also started uh, figuring out how to how to print in China. Um, we put out a game called Runebound, which was the first game that 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 that, that we made in China, and that opened up a whole another again a whole another level of game design. Another important aspect that that came came about was that we got the Lord of the Rings license back, and also in about two thousand. Uh, and we started putting out some Lord of the Rings products. This was before the movies came out, and um, and that was I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan, so so that was a big deal for me personally to be able to put some of those games out. Um, but um, uh, with that, we we also got connected since we were doing well with book related games. Um, but I got we got um, turned on by a, a, one of our employees, Brian Wood. He he said, "Hey, we should really be looking into this Game of Thrones business." <laughs> So you guys got just an early shot at all of these soon-to-be huge IPs. So I read those books, and I, they were awesome, and, then, and nobody really knew about them. So, so we, we um, went out and got that license, too, and, and we put out um, some, some card games and board games. And, and that's, that's kind of when I really started getting fascinated by taking, taking some of the concepts of the American School of, of Game Design and some of the some of the trends that were emerging out of European uh, you know, game design, which was typically... Uh, you know, non-conflict, but but they had very uh, interesting uh, me mechanics, uh, and some of them allowed you to do a lot, you know, with a little, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and very minimalistic kind of approach, and, and rather than simulationist approach. And I thought that was fascinating. I thought there was a way to to take some of those philosophies and saying, well, you know, I'd rather be, you know, shooting zombies or or, or building space empires than trading wool. Um, and, and so. <laughs> But 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 there's some awesome stuff going on in these underlying online mechanics because they, they get a lot of stuff done in an exciting way and they make they make interesting decisions. So so how, how can how can we work at that? And so my, my first attempt of really trying to merge a school of game design was the Game of Thrones board game, um, which is still still selling today actually. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and the, the philosophy there was to take concepts from from American uh, you know game design. Um, with uh, I, I love simultaneous movement and, 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 to, and to, to create as much interlaced uh, movement as possible, something I really got, got into at the time. Um, and so that did really well. Uh, Runebound did really well. I, mean, we, I started to figure out what FFG was, what, what kind of games we, we should do and, and what kind of road we wanted to take. And uh, so about 2004, we decided that, again, Twilight Imperium was out of print, but for, 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 some, for some reason, which was, of course, I'm very, very uh, humbled and honored and, and gratified by. For some reason, the, the Toronto Imperium and all its editions, the first two editions, had a, still a pretty big fan base. We kept getting people coming back to us asking real questions mm -hmm. and wanting more expansions and, and uh, wanted a bit more and more. And so it, it, it just wasn't something that I wanted to, to put by the wayside because it was this awesome fan base and, 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 and customer base that wanted more. And, and uh, of course, I was attached to the, the universe at the time and, and also the fact that that was the first thing we did. It was a pretty cool time around 2004 because there was all this stuff going on. Um, the Lord of the Rings movies were, were, were happening. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, so there was, uh, the business was, was in a quite, quite exciting spot. It was a, the whole industry had this sense of like, you know, being on the cusp of exciting things. Board games were starting to 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 become meaningful again in the from the commercial right. side of the hobby, and uh, so I, I sat for about a month. I I, I left early every day, and I, I sat and I tried to figure out how how can I take Twilight Imperium from what it was to to what it to what it could be with this new new philosophy, and so the game design sort of got thrown away almost completely, and then rebuilt uh, using uh, using a couple of sort of key concepts that that um, um, what it really comes down to is of course is the role selection system. The unique part of that was was we would split it into something that I could do and something else everybody else could do, mm -hmm. right? Um, which which then got rid of the phase structure, um, so you no longer slave the phases. The phases were actually something you were choosing, um, to, to and and uh, you were choosing to to uh, to participate or you're choosing to when, when they would do. It. There was there was more agency from the player in that, uh, and then the the actual command system, which created the the the, the sense of an economy of your attention. Um, and it also allowed us to, to put these counters on the board, which would simulate kind of a simultaneous movement. Of course, it, what it did, it, it, it created bite-sized movement. So I would do this, you would do this, and it greatly reduced uh, the downtime. And all suddenly, everything came together in that way. So that was an important 
realization for us, and that that not only went into Twilight Imperium, but it went into the whole philosophy going forward of everything we did of, of yeah. trying to tell a rich story, to have have rich artwork, uh, and, and to try to to use a combination of of in depth in depth rules that would try to further the story, but also try to make them as as simplistic and elegant as we could. Um, and I would say that that evolved over time as we got more talented staff and, and as, as we learned from, you know, what worked and what didn't work. But the other really important part was, 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 the, was the gamble of really trying to make this edition, you know, I'd always dreamt of making a big game full of plastic and, and uh, with the, our connections in China, it became possible for the first time really to make really high quality plastic. We'd done these very flimsy plastics in the U.S. with a couple of guys that, that uh, just happened to, their dad had to own a plastics factory. So they helped us make some really simplistic ships for the second edition and, and uh, in an expansion for the first. But it, uh, we were actually more of a, more of a real business at, in, in 2004, I think we maybe had, you know, 15, 16 employees and, and uh, we were doing a lot of productions and, and we learned a lot. Uh, and uh, so I decided that we should really be, uh, well, actually what, what's interesting is that we had, we were part of the bidding to try to design War of the Ring. So uh, oh, wow. uh, Sophisticated Games had, um, had had put out a request to do a big strategy game for, for Lord of the Rings, and and, uh, and I put in a bid for it, and, and um, a few other companies put in a bid for it. And when they and when he got here for my presentation, what I had done is I had put two two of our square game boxes together and glued them together side by side and created <laughs> this really big, huge, uh, you know, long, um, epic sized box. And uh, I thought it was really cool, and I showed them to them. And we had, we had, we had, I think we had pasted a Lord of the Rings art on there, and, and um, we didn't end, end up. We ended, we ended up not getting picked. And uh, Roberto's company uh, at the time, Nexus, got you know got picked for it. Uh, we were good friends with them, and we were able to help them sell the game in the U.S. So it wasn't a big deal. But I was fascinated by the giant box that I created for it. Um, I, right. thought it was, I thought it was awesome, and, and I thought we, we I thought it needed to be done. So that started building this, this, everything was moving towards doing this, this is huge, ambitious project. Uh, and once again, um, we, we kind of blew the world's minds by putting out an $80 board game, mm -hmm. uh, which was <laughs> right. completely crazy. It was, it was, uh, it was outrageous. It was, it was, it was uh, very controversial. Nobody thought it would, it would work. Um, and, um, and of course the box was so big that, that we had all sorts of reasons for why that would be a problem for people. Um, but we kind of persevered with it. We basically thought that what was most important wasn't the price point or, or even the box size. What was important was that we created something that fans really wanted. Right. And that we had to price it the way we did. We would love to price it lower. I mean, we, but we had to price it in the way we did in order to create a game that was as awesome as, as we wanted it to be. And also, of course, trying to stay within some commercial sense. So anyway, so we, we, uh, we, we made this big gamble. We put all this effort into it. And, and uh, I really sat down. I really started banging out the story now and, and, and really try to sort of bring all these thoughts together that I had. And we added more races. And, and, uh, and then we put that out. In 2005, it came out. And it was a huge success. Um, and uh, it really set the... It was really the just as the first edition was a milestone for the whole company. That that third edition was a milestone for understanding who we really were mm -hmm. and what kind of games mm -hmm. we wanted to make and and what the philosophy of design would would, would be going forward. And and um, and I think it was it was a just as important I think as as the first edition. Yeah. Well, and it was sort of a pinnacle for the the industry too. For so long, you hear people talk about kind of what is. I, when we were first introduced to the idea of Twilight Imperium, it was described as just like the ultimate board game, and and it feels like that is sort of what is kind of core to your to beliefs with all this is you're you're constantly trying to push the bounds of what is even possible in the you know w within the production capabilities. What is the most we could possibly squeeze, and what's the most we could poss possibly get out of people, which already sets them up with that idea of like this is gonna be the most epic thing I've ever played. Uh, and and they go into that with that energy, which then the universe kind of reinforces by being a huge epic, you know, galaxy sprawling uh, uh, universe. What what hopefully happens is when when you're playing is that you you are you're having a journey. Uh, you're having a journey of you know start with a, and a story with a start, beginning, and a middle, and an end. And, and hopefully uh, you you kind of feel like you can. You, you can tell a story and sit and commiserate about what happened after you're done. Mm -hmm. You need, in order to do that, you kind of, all the other stuff kind of reinforces it. Uh, you know, game length being one. 
And then yeah. when you say when you say epic, it's not always just the components and the and the box size <laughs> and the cost. Is as is many people are like I can't play a game for six to eight hours. It's impossible. Um, right. <laughs> but I don't think I don't think you can really get the same experience if you don't. I think you have to have right. that, you have to have that journey. Uh, and so it is not a game you can pull out casually. Um, but that's what it is. Um, right. So if you don't like that, then don't play it. Right. Right. Well, I think I think that aspect. Of, we really have to thank you for that specific aspect of this game because that is what has made this show basically possible. There's not really other board games where you could just essentially just talk about that game for an hour every single week, um, unless it has that level of scope, basically. Well, it's also a game like, like Twilight, and what I try to bring into it, and this is what I love most about games, is, is where you, you try to, as much as possible, allow the players themselves to be, to be part of the game, to so, so put themselves right. into the game. This, there's almost a role-playing aspect to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yes. And uh, the, the, that's, that's really important. Um, and uh, the, the sense of negotiation and talking and, and uh, you know, trying to, to cut deals or to threaten and saber rattle or all, all these things are all in good fun, of course. And, and um, uh, I think that that really helps uh, from an emotional perspective to sort of bring people in as long as they as long as they actually, you know, lean in enough to to actually, you know, be a part of it and to take the time to play it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a, uh, that role playing aspect is is such an interesting element of the game. Uh, and and I want to ask you about sort of the. It feels like you have two uh, branches of your game design, but I wonder how much to you they they are similar because you've got all these games under your belt where you've taken an existing IP and you're sort of creating a situation where the players can somewhat enact the events of that IP. So that they, they know the story going into it and maybe they're, they're making changes, but Twilight Imperium is more about here's some history, but from this point forward, from the moment you sit down to play, you have no preconceived notions. So for those two things, what, I guess what goes into those two ty- uh, types of methods and, and which to you is, is sort of your preferred method. I mean, d- d- is adapting, easier and more fun or is it more the openness of the ti universe is what keeps bringing you back you know it, I, I think it varies i mean i i, I um, most people would probably want to try to make their own universes if they could um but simply because it's it's kind of fun to create something and and it's also it's also a little bit less uh, less restrictive but uh, at the same time it's also really fun to be working in you know the star wars universe or the right. rings universe or whatever because you get to you get to you know play with characters and stories that that, that you really love um, Game of Thrones was interesting. That the board game is interesting because Westeros is a pain in the nuts. Um, <laughs> Westeros is this long, narrow, you know, <laughs> continent, and and uh, how, how do you make a strategy game with six different factions that are somehow balanced with, with that? Because <laughs> some right. are next to each other, others are in the distant, you know, far flung part of the board. Um, so there, there's some there's some things that you know you, you wish you could do. Saying that let's make. Westeros a round circle or something, you know, <laughs> right? Geometrically apart, and so we could balance that better. But that that um, you kind of have to deal with what you got uh, in terms of that. Um, George is a great, 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 great um, licensor. Uh, you know, he was very forgiving and he was very uh, permissive of, of what to do. It's just a few things that that, that concerned him. Um, but I mean, when you start dealing with with uh, with other big licenses, whether it's Games Workshop licenses or Star Wars or Lord of the Rings or Battlestar Galactica, any of those. You, you do get uh, quite a more of a regimented uh, process to, to make sure that you're staying within the boundaries of what can be right. improved, um, and, and so that that's that that can be you know um, bur- can be burdensome, but but mostly uh, it's it's worth it because you enjoy the subject matter and, and because um, you know, the commercial upside of a license obviously has has some benefits. Yeah, uh, it I, I like this uh, comparison to George R. R. Martin. Uh, I, I'm I'm a fan of the books as well and and something he talks a lot about is writing as a as a gardener uh where he kind of throws elements out there and then lets those he, he he'll write and rewrite and let things flesh out but i know a big part of his writing process is just like i'm gonna build the entire bloodline of the targaryens and then i'll come up with stories as we go and i wonder for you from a board game design perspective and in trying to create stories for these things 
what what is your approach to those sorts of elements uh you know the the, the biggest kind of example being like which came first the the quan or the idea of a planet next to a wormhole right like do, do you do you decide quan has two resources and one influence and is next to a wormhole and go what's the story or did you know the story of quan so quan i mean what was what we have to do in 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 uh in story we have to create kind of a kind of a point of you know nexus point where there's a conflagration that will that will set historical events you know um off Right. Uh, and, and obviously, I always felt that, that uh, if there ever was a wormhole, those would probably be pretty important, you know. Um, <laughs> right. And uh, it's, actually, it's actually one of the fun. The, there, are, there are many people who have a lot of fun with the A-hole and the B-hole. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. right. And, and it's but, but, the, the, uh, but obviously, you know, a wormhole, in, in theory, if it connects two different parts of the galaxies, would, would probably be a very important place for trade and, and uh, you know, uh, sort of a strategic point. So, 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 so it made sense that there was... Some strategic point uh, that 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 would cause uh, you know um, be a, be a hot spot for that that would set off greater events. So so I I, I needed a, a reason to to have the empire you know you know dissolved and I needed to be a hot spot and then so I thought well wormholes are probably made sense for that and and uh, obviously a planet next to a wormhole is also very helpful because it can be used as a staging area and so so Quan mm-hmm. right. became that and and uh, um, the when you're designing stories for games, um, it is a. I think it's probably pretty different than from than from a writing a novel, because you're right. You're doing it from a need based uh, aspect. Uh, you, you're not you're not seeing see what will grow. It's like you kind of have to have another race. <laughs> right. You want to get another right. race out there. Right. It, it's it, 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 We can't tell people that there's no other races in here because they didn't grow. Up. Um, we, we have to, we have to put them in there. And, and so what you try to do, what I try to do anyways, is first of all, come up with something that's, that's interesting and novel. And then ideally put something in that feels like it has roots, uh, and maybe even clarifies backstory. Um, so when you have a race that comes out, like there's a, a one Z one X or whatever that, that comes out and, and sort of says, well, this is a new race guys, but it's, it's actually interesting because by learning about this race, you'll actually learn more about the others as well. Um, and so you can kind of build a story, you know, in layers, but when you do it for a game, you almost have to do it in reverse. So you're, uh, what you try to do is, is you should try to maybe leave enough vagueness open so you can start to fill, fill those layers of the onion in deeper in later. Uh, because generally speaking, you, 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 you there's only such much amount of text that people want to read in, in a board game right. and, uh, and, uh, the amount of, m- amount of money it takes to, to put it in there probably only makes sense to a certain point. My, my approach is, is obviously to be game first you know i need to make a game that that that's fun and 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 it's exciting and and it has a story and so how can i how can i create cool game elements and and uh create uh, both a sense of depth and story but also not to create a sense of like destiny because in the end it, what's what's going to happen with this universe is up to the players right yeah that's interesting that it's like uh for for twilight imperium or like an like an original fictional universe you can kind of be game first and then story second whereas with all the adapted things obviously it's story first and then how do we make a game out of this basically i mean yeah, we had the same we did the same the same kind of concept and uh fantasy fly had this terranoth universe which was a kind of a generic fantasy universe because uh, we had a lot of games we wanted to do that were fantasy and made sense to, to have one but um if if you make it too too precise, or um, then then all suddenly it, you're starting to limit what you can do with your games. Uh, and right. uh, if you make it too, uh, if you make something that that seems like it can be solved, that, then you're you're closing the door to the imagination of the players. So right. it, it's it is a it is a kind of a almost like more of a non-linear way of trying to to provide background on a universe. You don't provide them with a big volume that you read. You, you're you're giving people insights here and there. You have a race description here, a short piece of fiction there, um, maybe a insert in a rule book that there, and, and, and you're, you're trying, to, trying, trying to build on that, um, particularly with board games. With role-playing games, it gets a little easier because you can really spend a lot of time and effort of, of actually trying to build up some of that background and create a little bit more sense of um, sense of cohesion to everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but sometimes there's also a benefit of, of just leaving everything a little more murky uh, because it allows people to put you know their own roots into the story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious at this point, like, um, in the, 
and kind of exploring your history as a board game designer, I'm wondering at this at this stage, like where you're at right now, do you kind of miss like the early early days of like kind of DIY almost like design where you're kind of just like kind of making all of it happen yourself or like or is it when you think of those times you're just kind of like oh I would I don't want to do that again basically <laughs> we all, we all love the past to some degree uh, it, it's it's um um it, it was a really remarkable journey uh, in, mm-hmm. uh it was it was really fun also because not only the the skills we we that we achieved ourselves but we were just you know lucky that and blessed that we could uh be part of an industry that that so many people started relating to and i think it was a self filling prophecy in a way because people started getting interested because there was good stuff because right. people started getting more interested we can make the stuff better mm-hmm. uh, and so a virtuous cycle i think happened in the in the industry um particularly in the board game side and, and everything but i mean the, the industry has really really grown i mean the first gen con i went to back in 96 um which was show twilight imperium actually the, the prototype that we had um, there was maybe 20,000 people, 22,000 people back in Milwaukee. And I think this, this year, this said there was about 80,000 people. Yeah. yeah um, right. So it's, it's really grown a lot. Um, and, uh, not only has it grown, but I think it's, it's grown a number of people, but it's also grown into the general culture. So I think there are more people that are half gamers, uh, now than there ever has been that, you know, that are mm-hmm. that, that aware of it. Yeah. Um, I know that we would hire people from the outside who didn't know about the gaming industry and then they would work for us for a year and then they would be astounded when they came to tell us that, well, it turns out that their uncle and their cousins and everybody know about this stuff. And they didn't know about it. <laughs> so, so it's, it's really, uh, it's really taken root a bit in, in, uh, in, you know, in the culture and it's, and it's slowly changing, um, you know, the, the availability of it. Cause it used to be only maybe four to 800 stores in the U S would actually carry any of this stuff. And they, they were mm-hmm. typically not very wealthy stores because of the small market. But now it's all grown. The stores have become a lot better. The the uh, and some of the some of the key titles are moved into the into the larger markets, so more people have access. Uh, and so the it's it's been a, a great great journey to to sort of see it all 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 evolve. Yeah. Did, did did you ever imagine it would? I mean, when you know when you're first doing the initial Twilight Imperium, did you have any idea the the legs it would have and and where it would take you did you have kind of an inkling of like i think this could be the start of something big or was it just not at all rolling the dice yeah <laughs> not at all it's i mean we were it was it was it was a last ditch effort to save the company and and uh and to to make sure that that our investors got some sort of a return it's been really uh it's been really a, sort of a small miracle uh, and the, the fact that you guys have a podcast on a board <laughs> game is, is crazy you know and it's 100 episodes so it's it's I, I could not have have hoped for for anything more. Um, I, I hope that it will have a have a life of its own now. Um, you know, it's now it's in the hands of FFG and and uh, Asmodee, and I think they uh, you know that they, they'll have a future you know beyond me. Uh, so it feels a little bit like you know a, a child that left home. Right. And, uh, <laughs> so I'm uh, I'm I'm really excited to to have that been part of it. And um, hope to hope to play it, uh, you know, maybe twenty years from now, right. sixth, sixth edition out there or something. Um, does your mind kind of still like wander back into that world every once in a while, though? Like, are do you ever kind of like start thinking about new story stuff for Twilight Imperium or anything like that? I, yeah, well, yeah, I do, uh, of course, yeah. Um, but but uh, but in the end, um, uh, in the end, it's it's um, you know, you I also try. I have some other things that I'm working on, and and. Um, it's always nice to, to think back on, on, on the old playgrounds. Sure, I, I think I think everybody does, but right, uh, but, right. but it's not. Uh, it, it's uh, I'm I'm on to uh, so some other some other things now. That's that's exciting. So uh, um, I, uh, I uh, I'm I'm pretty uh, have have a great confidence in, in the team at FFG that took it over. Uh, Dane uh, uh, Beltrami was a was a huge fan uh, of mm-hmm. the game and and uh, have a very sound sound you know sound approach to it. And and uh, I think he will. Uh, He'll do a great job carrying it forward uh, with whatever they're going to do. Yeah, he's great. He's great. Um, so uh, your new, it the new company, the uh, Strange Stars, correct? That's what it's called. Right. What's kind of uh, what's kind of the goal with that? Do you want to speak on that a little bit as far as like what uh, what you're trying to do? Like what what kind of is the future for Christian T. Peterson right now? Well. <laughs> I probably can't speak too much to it. Uh, mm-hmm. The the uh, I mean, Strange Stars itself is a is a it is a company, but it's actually it's it's more of an investment fund, um, mm-hmm. and uh, it's something that I've put together with some of uh, some old friends and partners that I've I've been associated with over the years, uh, and 
from, from that, uh, we have a, a number of staff members, but, but what we really are doing is that we're, um, we're, we're listening to other people who have, need some investment, but we're also incubating uh, a few companies that I'd wanted to make for, for a long time. So um, we actually have three, three companies that, that, that we're uh, building. Um, one is a software company, one is, a, is kind of an entertainment consumer products game company, and uh, the last one is a, is a VR-based technology company. Wow. Uh, so, so those are the three things that, that we're doing, keeping us, keeping us plenty busy. What, what exactly they're called and what they're going to do, I, I, I'd rather not say at this point. Uh, I'd rather, yeah, sure, sure. I'd rather uh, show than tell. Um, <laughs> so so the, um, but that's, that's, keep, that's keeping me busy and excited. I get to do a lot of creative things and then be with some really talented, uh, experienced people. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been fun the last year. Yeah, that does sound really exciting, actually. Um, I kind of want to circle back to uh, this is kind of uh, less like kind of designy question, but I think a lot of people will be kind of curious about like what when you sit down to play Twilight Imperium, what kind of player would you kind of characterize yourself as if you had to describe like kind of your style as a player? Are you like do, if I played Ti with you, would you like extort me? Would you kind of like try and bully me? Are you more of a like wheel and deal kind of uh, friendly trader kind of? Uh, no, 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 I'm, 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 I'm the guy usually that people want to eliminate because they think. <laughs> so I'm, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the chest pounding, uh, you know, uh, ambitious, aggressive uh, 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 role player. I, I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm definitely not the, uh, not the quiet guy waiting for the right moment and then the, ends up winning the game. I'm, I'm, I'm having too much fun for that. So, so I, I, <laughs> I, I, I will win the game on occasion, but, but um, I, I'm, I'm usually enjoying the experience uh, m more and, and also. Um, you know, being the designer of the game and, and the creator of the game, people think that I'm better at it, so that they try to kill me as soon as possible. So, so I've kind of gotten used to it and just just enjoy just enjoy it. Um, designers many times are not the best at their own games. Um, mm -hmm. They that they, they think about it differently, I think, than than, than the players. Um, so. No, I, I, I hopefully uh, am, am reasonably fun to play with, and and um, and uh, I, I'm usually one of the guys that will make that will make you know uh, a dramatic moves and right and right. Uh, and uh, you know have speeches and and uh, generally be obnoxious. So so I, do, right, do you have right. any favorite factions that have that kind of goal aligned with you? Is, uh, is there any that you question. really love sitting down with because it, it lets you shine in that role? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the the uh, I, I wouldn't say that there's a particular race. No, I think it's more of an attitude uh, that, that that you bring to the game. I mean, I, I like playing. Um, I like playing a lot of the races. I like the L one G one X, but but I'm also, you know, I. I, I Probably enjoy the political phase most. So, so uh, there's, mm -hmm. uh, there's, um, I don't know. I like, I like Hakan. Um, I like to play the um, the Letnev uh, for military race. I mean, it, it, there's no no particular favorite. I, I think maybe the maybe the Hakan is you know has near and dear to my heart mainly because the big lion guy on all the covers. Uh, right, right. <laughs> it's uh, just your that, that's your space cat, right? Um, exactly. So, exactly. So, but uh, no, I, I will sort of take take the race as it is. I think I think you can play um, you, you you can play all of them and hope and hopefully have hopefully have fun with them. Yeah. Um, well, so uh, I'm wondering if you would be down to speak uh, with us at all about uh, Midnight Chronicles, and can we expect? Is there any um, ambition? For CTP to put his filmmaker's cap back on. <laughs> um, I'll tell you something funny about the Midnight Chronicles. It's it's how it actually evolved. Um, the it was more of a business side thing than a creative thing. It was um, back in 2004, about the same time as all this other stuff was happening. I, I was, um, I think I got my first video iPod there, mm -hmm. um, and I was pretty convinced that that video was going to be a really prevalent force and that um, uh, phones and mobile devices would be able to stream all this content and, uh, <laughs> and, and that um, and that the distribution of, of visual content was going to be let, uh, not an issue in the future but it, but whether you could make it and whether you could market it would be the important ones so I wanted to to understand what it took to, to make some visual content because I felt we could we could use it to promote our games we could use it to uh, create uh, trailers etc uh, etc et so so we we started making just a small, the whole concept was just to make a small 10 minute kind of, you know, concept about what, what, um, you know, what could we do? Could, could we show something cool from one of our universes? And we decided right. that, that we decided that that midnight was, was, was a cool one to do. 
uh, partly because fantasy was hot with Lord of the Rings out in the in theaters and, and so on. So I decided, decided to, to, to sort of look into that. And I learned a ton from that. Um, it, was, it was a really fascinating process, but it was super hard. I think uh, 2006, when we actually shot, shot the, the film, was probably one of the hardest years of my life. Uh, we were running the company. Uh, I had a new daughter that was born. And, and oh, uh, yeah, perfect timing to really endeavor on a, on a feature we were film set. We trying to set. do this, and, and, and uh, you know, we didn't have a lot of money to do this, and we were, we were trying to do something, something ambitious. What we really tried to do originally was to do a, do a TV show. So we wrote uh, two episodes. What you see as the Midnight Chronicles movie is actually – intended to be a tv show so it was, it was it was it was written as a tv show um and we started shooting it and then 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 we were told there was no way we could ever get any money by for a tv <laughs> show so we had to make it into a film so it was like oops okay so we, had, we <laughs> then we, we, we basically had to cut it together into a film but it was it was a huge experience uh, it was it was a very very difficult uh thing to to manage in, in on my part and learned a ton um, and uh, we got a product out of it, which is which is interesting, whether whether you right. like little indie movies or not. But the the great thing about it was that we actually developed a lot of um, uh, a, a lot of skills in in video production and so on. And so we we started, and so some of the people that came to work on Midnight um, actually started back then. One of them is still with me today, Keith Hurley. And um, we had a little video team there, and we said, well, let's start making trailers for board games. And I yeah. we were the first ones to do that. And I think the first one we did was Tide of Iron, which is a World War II uh, game. And we started to you know, put that online. We put it on, on YouTube, which was just kind of nascently beginning to be, to be a thing. Uh, and, and so we, as the first of really of anybody, we were able to make these relatively high, for the time, high production value uh, trailers and, and video previews. Of our game, which became which our game, which became a, a huge uh, marketing aspect to us. Uh, we also right. we also as technology did come out in the way that we had hoped and predicted. We also felt that we could then start distributing it to people's phones. And when the iPad came out, we we did something called the Fantasy Flight Media Center, which was actually a uh, an iPad in a custom chassis, and we put it out to about 600 game stores, and we could actually push all of our video content out to all those game stores. So. Um, it, it was really a business experiment that, that ended up as a movie and, and uh, tremendously difficult and hard. And, and I'm in I'm mm-hmm. huge respect, hats off for, for what it takes to, to make those things. Um, I, I don't have any, any uh, huge desire to go back and do that again. I, I, right. I, would, uh, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't mind being involved in something, but, but not, but, but not uh, as, as, the, uh, you know, as the tip of the spear and, and, uh, and carrying it all. Uh, it was... Uh, uh, it was quite. It was quite remarkable. I think there's things uh, that you can do today with, with uh, there's different kinds of storytelling that's happening with with right. uh, with software and VR and all those things. I'm I'm, I'm more interested in in that than your um, more traditional movie uh, uh, TV show approach. Yeah, I I mean I think that's very true. Uh, even just like uh, actual play RPG shows, people filming like basically people playing D and D. Um, all of those shows I feel like have integrated very well uh, with the business of board games. So I feel like your your original thought was like totally on the mark of like this is there is going to be a component to this that is going to be video. I have a really weird question for you. Uh, so according to if you if you look at Twitter, you know basically uh, this is going to be a very controversial statement I'm about to make, but uh, Star Wars is basically dead, right? According to Twitter, <laughs> it's basically done. So let's say let's imagine for fun that the mouse, Mickey Mouse, comes by and is like, hey, I want to scoop up Twilight Imperium and make uh, some Twilight Imperium movies. Uh, and let's say for some reason you are kind of at the, uh, at the you're kind of the Kevin Feige of, uh, of this Twilight Imperium movie project. What would you say yes to that, basically? Let's say it's up to you. Um, <laughs> well, uh, it's, 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 first of all, to be clear, it's not up to me. Uh, it's it's uh, the, the, right. the IP in the game is, is owned by by uh, by Fantasy Flight now. Of course, of course. But let's say it was. Let's say it was for some reason. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's it's. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan, um, to say the least, of where Star Wars has gone the last couple of movies. Oh yeah, there you go. But uh, <laughs> but that's that's maybe just my age speaking. Um, I don't know. Um, the, mm-hmm. the, you know, it would be fantastic for them for somebody to come along and wanted to do to do content in that universe, uh, whether it's Disney or somebody else. I, I think uh, that I would prefer 
if if I had a couple of different studios, maybe Disney would not be my number one choice. Who who right? would you uh, who would you hire to be your your director? I mean, who who would you bring on? Who's the style? <laughs> yeah, who's got the style for Ti? Well, it depends on how, how you're filming it. I mean, so so one thing I was always fascinated by is how Games Workshop um, manages their IP uh, with 40K in particular. They do a wonderful mm-hmm. job with it because how do you do something in that universe without solving it, right? I mean, right. How, how, and and uh, they 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 treat the whole thing as a sandbox, and and they said, okay, we can tell lots of stories in here, but you have to kind of zoom in on them. You, you, you can't just solve the universe. So it kind of depends on what you want to do. Do you want to tell a story about, you know, some settlers on one planet that just happens to be in the backdrop of it? Or do you want to, do you want to tell a story of the giant, you know, colonial war with, with, uh, you know, the, the leaders of all the factions, you know, what, what, what kind of story are you actually telling? Right. Um, and I think, you know, all of that, all, all of it could be done. I would prefer that, that they didn't try to solve the universe in the same way that Star Wars does because Star Wars is a sense the whole universe is wrapped up in this in the story that you're that you're telling I would I would think that the IP would be better served if you if you told an epic story with, with huge consequence or whatever but it was mm-hmm. it was just a it was just a bit of the universe that that you're that you're uh, that you're seeing um, and that there's a sense it's a lot more out there even beyond the confines of the whatever drama is taking place at the moment I, I mean I, my my favorite director is probably Ridley Scott so, uh, oh, yeah. so it's really Scott would, 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 could do it is great, but there's so many great, great TV shows out there now, uh, that are able to tell, you know, long form stories. And, and, mm-hmm. uh, I think it's, it's just a, uh, it's a, it's just a pleasure to have all these, these wonderful TV shows. So somebody could tell a TV show in the Twilight Imperium universe would be, would be great fun. Um, so so Netflix, if you're hearing this, yeah. approach. <laughs> the yeah. pitch is out there. Asmodee, We're ready. And I, and I know exactly who you have to talk to. So just, <laughs> right. just let me know. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I, that, I mean, obviously, the, the, I, I think the whole gaming industry has done so well. And there's some really interesting properties out there that people have interest in. And sooner or later, I think some of the, the studios out there and some of the, some of the media creators will start having some, some, uh, some hits from, from taking uh, concepts from 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 games i don't yeah. think i don't think you should make a monopoly movie that doesn't really make any sense but you, you, you can make there's a lot of other uni- universes surrounding games that that uh to me would, would would be great fun and would really add to the uh add, add to the ip surrounding the game if you could have some have some films or some yeah. tv shows yeah i'm sure i'm i'm sure at some point we will see that they that will be a thing um probably not monopoly though i think we can all we can all agree to pass on the monopoly film <laughs> yeah, no, there, 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 there are some, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> skip, 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 skip it. Is there anything in particular, Christian, that you kind of want to say to our audience? Well, sure. Thanks for uh, carrying me up on this amazing journey with Twilight Imperium for the last 25 years. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. It's been humbling, and uh, I hope that... Uh, Hope that you'll have a lot of fun for many years with it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think to speak on, on behalf of as many as we can, uh, we just appreciate everything that you've, you know, given us, even even if it was sort of just a a, a random effort to start with. It, it really blossomed into something that uh, so many people really, really just truly love and, and want to see grow in as many ways as possible. Uh, and so it's just a huge thank you to, to you for giving us this, this world and this game and uh, everything that it, kind of contributes to to all of our lives uh it's a it's a huge deal so we're we're incredibly thankful all right yeah. well you're yeah. your guys are so welcome um I, I hope uh i hope that uh that you'll have another hundred episodes oh for sure <laughs> yes <laughs> for sure where there's no there's no stopping us uh thank you so much for talking to us today i really really appreciate it man this yeah you guys are really very welcome awesome. um uh, good luck with the 100th episode and uh let me know if you need anything for me in the future of course. Of course. Absolutely. Of course. All right. Thank you. Take care. All Thanks, right. everyone. Bye bye. Um, well, I I hope you liked that. And I hope uh, you know, I hope we a hundred more episodes and a hundred more after that. A um, hundred more and a hundred more. I love that at the end of that interview we got we got our heads really, really in the clouds with the idea of a TI movie. Uh and we that took up way more of the interview than I expected it to uh to be. Well, but, in a lot of ways, this is the sequel episode to everybody's favorite right. episode of the show, <laughs> Twilight Imperium, the movie starring myself and Alex Lilburn. Um, if you all remember that chestnut, best, best episode, L- yeah. loved it from start to finish. We'll accept no criticism for <laughs> Twilight Imperium, the movie the episode. Movie. 
Uh, well, so I think uh, if you loved that interview with Christian T. Peterson and all the new juicy information we got about Twilight Imperium and the history of it, you should rate our podcast. Rate it on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else that you listen to it. Uh, give us a big five-star top interviewers rating. Let us know that we are the best interviewers you've ever listened to, better than yes. Mark Maron himself. Uh, yes. You can also find us on Twitter at Space Cats Pod, on Facebook, Space Cats Peace Turtles. You can find posts every week at the Twilight Imperium subreddit, and you can join our Patreon. Uh, we have a Galactic Council episode coming up very soon, so if mm-hmm. you want to be a part of that vote to determine what the next Galactic Councilor episode topic is going to be, uh, now's your chance to get in there. $5 a month, and you can become a Galactic Counselor. Uh, you can also join our Discord and uh, hang out and talk with us and talk with all the people that play TI on Tabletop Simulator or in person, and there's just always conversations going on there. Pretty much constantly. I am on another show. Um, oh, yeah. It's a true crime comedy show. It's called Dumb and Busted. Um, it is a show where essentially we uh, talk about a criminal, a criminal even, uh, that has done something dumb and they got in trouble and then we make fun of them for their crimes, basically. <laughs> That is essentially the show. Uh, it's really fun. I co-host it with uh, my friends Allison Klop- Klop- Kloplin and Hannah Ether. <laughs> is, she, is she your friend? <laughs> uh, she's my friend. I know her name. Okay, <laughs> I know her name. I'm not looking it up. It's Kloplin, not Kloplin. I wanted to call it Kloplin. C- call her Kloplin. Oh my god. <laughs> I haven't eaten t- so. I just I today I did uh, Rose City Comic Con. Um, oh, I did. Uh, I was on a show called Spec Script, which is, if you remember, a show I did like a year ago. Um, I was on that. I, yeah, you were on it too. Um, and I did it today. It was really fun, but I am completely exhausted and basically a crazy person. But please uh, consider checking out Dumb and Busted if you like true crime uh, style yeah. content, which I, I have no idea what kind of overlap that is with Twilight Imperium, probably zero. But <laughs> if there is, if you do like that kind of stuff or you want to check that kind of stuff out, check us out, Dumb and Busted. Yeah, and uh, I think we've kind of committed ourselves to look forward to next week's episode because we're doing uh, This Imperium Life. There's your sneak preview announcement. Yeah. We never do this, but uh, uh, This Imperium Life number five, get get your get your earbuds out because that's going to be a fun one to listen to. Yeah, we got a lot of stories. If anybody wants to send in some last minute stories, get them in. Uh, we are, we've, we've got, uh, I don't know, quite we've got backlog. quite the... Yeah, quite the treasure trove, but if you got a juicy one, throw it in there and you might make it in. You might slide right in. And that's it. That's our episode. That's, <laughs> we finished episode 100. We've done it. 100 right. episodes completed. Yeah. Whew. Whew. Mm-hmm. And now we to may s- sleep. <laughs> yeah. And now we, and now we may take a quick nap before doing 100 more and 100 more after that and 100, and always 100 more episodes and hunt like what are we even gonna do for 200 because we we kind of worked our way up the ladder yeah Yeah. we've we've interviewed the ultimate daddy of all daddies episode 200 is when we uh announce ourselves as the designers of twilight imperium fifth edition always that's what it is yeah yeah Yeah, that's what it is is we are doing fifth edition and it's uh fans only it's our game now our version of Twilight Imperium versus <laughs> Fantasy Flight's version, and it gets all like cutthroat and weird. That sounds fun. So we're doing a Kickstarter for Twilight Imperium <laughs> Fifth Edition. Um, we're just gonna sneak it out there before they even get a chance to make theirs. That sounds fun. <laughs> so look forward to that. That huge two and one hundred more episodes. Basically, two more years. We are going to betray Fantasy Flight in an in epic p- proportions. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Space Cats Peace Turtles, and thanks to Ben Prunty for the use of his music. You can find more at benpruntymusic.com and benprunty.bandcamp.com. Pax Magnifica, Bellum Gloriosum. <laughs>